about you, you friends from across the land and beyond. We are so glad you've joined us for this workshop entitled Socialism and Religion. This workshop will look at religion and socialism in today's world. We will examine various interpretations of socialism, as well as class conflict and opportunities for reconciliation. We are asking, what is our UU history regarding socialism? How does this conversation about socialism connect to what's happening in today's America? And how can Unitarian Universalists be helpful? Let's begin with a moment of connection. We gather in this moment and light this chalice with an awareness of history. The chalice symbol of Unitarian Universalism was commissioned in the context of Europe in the 1940s during World War II, where refugees from all walks of life, artists, intellectuals, dissidents came to escape the Nazis. Renewed resistance to authoritarianism is called for in these times. It is rising worldwide. With voter suppression, laws and policies that make demonstrating an ever greater risk and disinformation that sows confusion and mistrust. We have an answer to these disturbing trends. We as UUs are called to serve the world with love and a sense of justice. We point to freedom. The sponsor of this event is UUs for a Just Economic Community and is moderated by UU Class Conversations. Our speakers today are Dr. Dan McCannon, Reverend Judy Deutsch, Reverend Kimberly Johnson, and Reverend Robert Murphy. Dr. McCannon is the Ralph Waldo Emerson Senior Lecturer at the Harvard Divinity School. Dr. McCannon is an authority on American religion and its involvement with peace and justice movements. He will speak today about the history of socialism for Universalists and Unitarians in the United States. Hello everyone. It's great to be with you here at General Assembly. I've been asked to provide a historical perspective on Unitarian Universalism and Socialism. To do that, I will tell the stories of four 19th century socialists who were Unitarian or Universalist. Then I'll turn to three congregations in the early 20th century that supported the socialist movement during its heyday. These people in these congregations are part of a great cloud of witnesses who can sustain us in our religious life and activism today. They are no more perfect than we are, but we can learn from their stories. As I tell each story, I will lift up a specific gift for socialists today. The socialist movement, or at least the name socialism, originated in the early 19th century, just as Unitarianism and Universalism were becoming denominations. All three movements held the promise that people had enough love and creativity to build a world in which everyone could thrive. So it's no surprise that some Unitarians and Universalists embraced the promise of socialism. One of them was Abner Neelan. He's still remembered as the last person in the United States to be jailed for blasphemy. His prosecutors were Unitarian, and so were many of the people who petitioned for his release. Neelan himself had started as a Universalist but left the church to establish a Society of Free Inquirers in Boston in 1831. Freethinkers were the 19th century equivalent of 20th century humanists. They rejected revealed scripture, a supernatural deity, and state support for religion. Since Massachusetts churches received tax support until 1836, Neeland had his work cut out for him. Inspired by the utopian socialists Robert Owen and Fanny Wright, he fought just as hard against patriarchal marriage and capitalist economics. Neeland was active in the Working Men's Party, which was the first political party in the world to stand on the side of the working class. We can thank the working men for our system of universal public education, but they hoped for more. One thing they hoped for, and one gift that Abner Neeland has left for us, is a deep commitment to investing in young people. The Working Men's Platform called for a 100% estate tax that would provide each young adult coming of age with enough capital to set up shop as an independent artisan. With today's young adults facing declining standards of living and a mountain of college debt, 
It's time for us to redeem Neelan's promise by enacting free college tuition and a universal basic income. Early in his ministerial career, Neelan served the Universalist congregation in Philadelphia. Philadelphia Universalism also shaped one of the most colorful socialists of all time, the novelist George Lepard. Lepard was the great granddaddy of Occupy Wall Street, publishing books with titles like New York, its upper 10 and lower million. He told sensational stories about rapacious capitalists who worshiped in fashionable churches and the heroic workers who fought them. He was also the first socialist to claim that Jesus himself was a class conscious worker. In fact, according to Lepard, Jesus became divine precisely when he recognized his kinship with the entire brotherhood of toil. Lepard was not a perfect model for socialists today. His socialism was intersectional in the sense that he saw the connections between industrial capitalism in the North, plantation slavery in the South, and the sexual exploitation of women, especially by charismatic preachers, whom he described as a congregation of reptiles. But he didn't take the time to understand the experiences of women or people of color from the inside. He portrayed them as passive victims or even as monsters degraded by their suffering. The heroes of all the parts novels were people like himself, young white men who were very, very angry about injustice. Socialism still has a lot of young men like that. Lepard's gift to them, and perhaps to all of us, is that at his best, he channeled his anger into artistic creativity that enraged others and inspired them to build a new society. A socialist contemporary of Lepard's was the transcendentalist philosopher, Margaret Fuller. You might remember her as the intellectual and individualistic friend of Emerson who penned the first book-length exposition of feminist philosophy. Fuller critiqued the gender binary, affirming that there is no wholly masculine man, no purely feminine woman. And she urged people of all genders to pursue any vocation to which they felt called. If you ask me what offices women may fill, she declared, I reply, let them be sea captains, if you will. Fuller became a socialist by following her own advice. She didn't become a sea captain. Her vocation was as a journalist. She wrote book reviews for the New York Tribune, then reports on her visits to prisons, asylums, and almshouses, and finally became an embedded war reporter during the Italian Revolution of 1848. Writing from the barricades, she hoped to inspire American solidarity with the socialist wing of that revolution. And so her gift today to socialists is the call for each of us to follow our own bliss using our specific gifts and passions in support of justice. The fourth 19th century socialist I'd like to tell you about is Peter Clark. Peter Clark was identified by his biographer as America's first black socialist because he was the first African American to run for office on the ticket of a socialist party. As the principal of Cincinnati's first publicly funded school for African Americans, Clark ran for state school commissioner and then for Congress. This was in the wake of the National Depression of 1873 and the Great Railroad Strike of 1877, events that created an opening for working class politics. Clark was a member of Cincinnati's first Unitarian congregation, where he built long term alliances with two powerful white politicians in Ohio, Republican Alfonso Taft and Democrat George Hoadley. Clark himself was sometimes a socialist, but also sometimes a Republican and sometimes even a Democrat. He claimed that he sided with the Democrats because he rejected the gratitude argument by which Republicans bind us to their party. The major parties have since traded places, but plenty of black socialists today chafe when Democratic Party leaders expect gratitude for a train of half-fulfilled promises. It's a bit hard to understand why Clark's lack of gratitude to the Republicans led him not only to the socialists, but also sometimes to support the Jim Crow Democrats. It's possible that his role as a principal of an all black school during a Republican campaign for desegregation played a role. In all his complexity, 
Clark brings a gift for contemporary socialists. The willingness to play pragmatic politics, to pit one major party against the other, can sometimes play a role in nudging all parties towards greater justice. The relationship between Unitarians, Universalists, and Socialists changed at the beginning of the 20th century. This period was the high point of American socialism, so far. Through the leadership of Eugene Debs, they unified into a single party that did well enough in national elections to shape the agendas of progressivism and the New Deal. They also created new paths for religious socialists. Previously, it was up to each individual to make a connection between their faith and their politics. They couldn't expect entire denominations to follow behind them. But with the rise of the social gospel movement, the denominations began speaking out. The Universalists came close to endorsing socialism in 1917, when they declared that in order for democracy to be complete, both industry and land would need to be democratized. A just economic order, they added, would give to every human being an equal share in the common gifts of God, in addition, all that they shall earn by their own labor. Many ministers or former ministers ran for office on the Socialist Party picket, among them Universalist Charles Vail. Non-denominational people's churches brought socialists together with anarchists and supporters of Henry George's single tax philosophy in which land would be nationalized through the imposition of a tax equal to its full rental value. In New York, the Church of the Socialist Revolution held mud gutter meetings in which they marched through the city, carrying a red flag and singing socialist hymns. On one occasion, they melted the American flag, along with those of the European powers, to protest nationalism. This was the context for the rise of community churches among Unitarians and Universalists. Unlike the Church of the Socialist Revolution, they were not explicitly aligned with the Socialist Party. In principle, they were as politically diverse as the communities where they existed. As John Haynes Holmes put it, a community church would recognize people as members of the church for the same reason that they're members of the town meeting, because they're citizens. In practice, though, Holmes's congregation in Manhattan and the others like it appealed especially to people involved in socialism and adjacent radical movements. The First World War was a key moment. Holmes class clashed with the Unitarian denominational leadership over their support of the war and then persuaded his congregation to claim a new identity as a community church. The people attracted to this vision supported a host of justice causes. Congregate Mary White Ovington, a white woman, was the administrative genius who partnered with black visionary W.E.B. Du Bois to create the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. <clears throat> Holmes himself served on the board of the NAACP and also that of the American Civil Liberties Union, which was created to defend the rights of socialists and pacifists who had spoken out against the war. Thus, the Community Church of New York's gift to us today is their capacity to build lasting institutions for social change. The Socialist Party of America did not survive the Cold War, but most of the other groups supported by Community Church are still around to inspire us, as is the church itself. In addition to supporting activist groups like the NAACP and the ACLU, the Community Church of New York encouraged the creation of new congregations, one of these was the Community Church of Harlem, also known as the Harlem Unitarian Church. If, you if you've read Mark Morrison Reed's books, you're familiar with the story of Egbert Etheridge Brown, the Jamaican minister who was so inspired by the Unitarian message that he left a promising career in the Methodist Church in order to attend Meadville Seminary, even though he was bluntly told that there would likely be no church for him to serve. He started Unitarian congregations in Jamaica and then in Harlem, always with limited and ambivalent support from denominational headquarters. As you use, we often tell the story as a cautionary tale about the reluctance of white power structures to invest in initiatives led by people of color. But the Harlem Church's significance reaches far beyond our denomination. It was a gathering place for Harlem socialists throughout the 20s and 30s. The congregation's founders included people like Wilfred Domingo, 
who had urged all blacks to become socialists in 1919, and Frank Crossway, who ran for Congress and for New York Secretary of State on the Socialist Party ticket. This was the heyday of the Garveyite movement, which asked blacks to migrate to Africa because America was beyond redemption. The socialists countered that they should instead make common cause with workers of all races. Harlem Community Church generally sided with the socialists, but it also offered a forum in which socialists, Garveyites, and communists could debate their visions for black liberation. Most participants were Caribbean newcomers to New York, and the congregation helped them find their voices as engaged citizens. One of its gifts to socialists today is its deep commitment to serve in its particular community, reminding us that all politics is local, even when we seek to dismantle global capitalism. The last congregation I'd like to lift up is the Community Church of Boston, organized by John Haynes Holmes and his Universalist ally, Clarence Skinner. Like other community churches, it hosted forums in which local radicals expressed their visions for social transformation, and the congregation lingered afterward to debate the merits of socialism, communism, anarchism, and pacifism. By 1927, its services were so popular that they had to be held in Symphony Hall, where crowds of more than 2,000 could gather. 1927 was also the year that anarchists Sacco and Vanzetti were executed in Massachusetts. Community Church's Gertrude Winslow visited them in their last days, and after the execution, she and the congregation continued to remember them each year, helping ensure that their memory would remain alive even to today, and that we would be able to tell their stories. And so the Community Church of Boston's gift to us is what I've been doing for these 15 minutes, the gift of history, reminding us that we are not alone in our struggles for justice today, but stand with the multitudes of past socialists who lived and died for equality and a free sharing of the fruits of human labor. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy your General Assembly. Reverend Judy Deutsch is a Unitarian Universalist minister who is one of the leaders for UUJEC. Reverend Deutsch is very active in the Medicare for All campaign. She worked with James Luther Adams, Today, Judy will speak about Reverend Adams and his importance in social justice work in liberal religion. The mission statement on the front page of Religious Socialism, the former quarterly publication of the Religion and Socialist Commission, of the Democratic Socialists of America used to say, quote, motivated by our different religious traditions, we believe that attitudes, priorities, and institutions can be changed to reflect a just and democratic use of the universe's bounty we believe in the value of work, work that contributes, that contributes to the common good and in the healing influence of respect for the differences as well as the commonness of human experience, end quote. James Luther Adams a Unitarian Universalist minister and the leading 20th century UU theological ethicist was an active member of the Cambridge-based chapter of the commission. And he was listed as member number one of the UUs for Socialism group that Reverend Bob Street started and that held meetings during the 80s at our UUA General Assemblies. Jim's socialist ideas are clearly stated in his sermon, God and uh, Economics, where he says, quote, 
democratic socialism urges that the democratic principles obtained in politics should be applied to the economic sphere. The aim is that of combining the prophetic sense of responsibility for the character of society at large with the social ideas that came to birth in congregational polity. The consent of the government, participation in the process of making social institutional decisions, the bearing of each other's burdens, the dispersion of power and responsibility, the achievement of a just relationship between the parts, end quote. In this sermon, Jim derives democratic socialism partly from the Old Testament concept of covenant and partly from the concept of covenant that emerged from 17th century Puritan congregations. Referring to the Old Testament concept of covenant, Jim says that covenant is, quote, a means whereby a transnatural, transcendent deity is represented as binding his worshipers to himself by a sovereign act of grace, eliciting a moral agreement and calling them to obedient allegiance and faithfulness, an agreement ostensibly entered into in voluntary con consent, an agreement which forms a bond of loyalty for the sake of fellowship with God and of harmonious living, righteousness and peace, end quote. Jim maintains, quote, the basis of the covenant is not so much law as it is affectionate response to liberation from bondage, arousing trust and faithfulness on the part of the individual as well as of the collective. And that violation of the covenant is not so much a breaking of the law as it is a breaking of trust, a violation of relatedness, end quote. Knowing that Jim, that Jim admired Paul Tillich a great deal and that he had translated and edited many of Tillich's writings, I was astonished to find that there is no mention of Tillich in the version of God and economics that has been available to me. Possibly, Jim had the good sense to realize that Tillich's ideas on socialism are so complex and too complex to be conveyed in a sermon. However, in his memoir, Not Without Dust and Heat, Jim states that when he came upon Tillich's religious socialism, Quote, I felt I had entered heaven, end quote. Born into a poor family where his father served for a time as a Baptist minister and later joined the Plymouth Brethren, an anti-worldly group that believed in the correctness and the truth of the Bible, and the importance of each member 
striving for holiness. Jin's reading in and out of high school introduced him to the larger world. At about the age of 15, his father's illness prompted Jim to work full time to support his family. After taking a night school course in legal shorthand, Jim started working as secretary in the local prosecutor's office. And afterwards, he became the secretary of the superintendent and then chief clerk of the Northern Pacific Railway. Desiring to expand his knowledge, Jim left that position to attend the University of Minnesota, working at the railroad in a different capacity, eight hours every night, so as to be able to continue to support his family and pay his own college expenses. Jim took a full schedule of courses, attended the local Baptist and Unitarian churches, and participated in a discussion club that asked many questions about the fundamental, the, about the fundamental, re, no, about the fundamentalist religions in which the participants had been raised. Strongly influenced by the advice of his professor of public speaking, who recognized and said that Jim, who was talking against religion all the time, had religion as his major passion and should therefore become a preacher. Jim enrolled then in Harvard Divinity School. He was ordained by the Second Church in Salem on May 25, 1927, and was called to serve that church. During the first year of his ministry there, Jim became involved in a labor strike at the Pequot Mills. He preached at a joint Protestant service saying that the workers' side, as well as the mill owner's side, should be circulated, and that impartial judges should assess the claims of both sides. Hitherto, the newspapers had printed only the owner's side. Jim took his sermon to the local newspaper which starting on the front page, published it in its entirety the next day. On that same day, the mill owners met with the workers at 5 p.m. And by 7 p.m., the strike was settled in such a way that at least a thousand mill workers paraded to Jim's home and thanked him. And not one member of his church reproached him, even though some of them were mill executives. Jim made his second trip to Germany in 1936, his first having been funded by a prize he had won in a sermon contest was in 1927. During that first trip, he found himself in an argument about Jews with some Nazis at a National Socialist rally. Jim was rescued by a German bystander who was grateful to Americans for the treatment that he had received 
in his earlier merchant marine days in the United States. The bystander whisked him away and took him home to dinner and later explained, in Germany these days, if you talk like that, you'll be beaten up. Now, prior to his 1936 trip, Jim had ascertained that in the United States, the major religion in churches was pietistic, emphasizing interpersonal relations and not collective responsibility. He found the same thing in Germany, but noted the muscle of Hitler's totalitarian regime went even further and eliminated any organizations with, that had some independence and was established voluntarily by citizens. Jim found that opposition to Nazism was stronger in the churches than in the universities, but that most of the opposition existed in a small percentage of the Protestant churches, those that were called the confessing churches. The members of the established churches called German Christians affirmed the validity of the Nazi regime. During his 1936 trip, Jim had carefully cut cardboard the size of the drawer of his traveling desk, put it at the bottom of the drawer, and hid beneath it secret papers from the underground, that is, the anti-Nazi confessing church group that he had been asked to bring to the United States. Thus, when the Nazis searched through the papers in his room, they didn't find them. Jim was interrogated by the Gestapo at their headquarters for two and a half hours, and his passport was kept by them for three weeks. The Gestapo had a detailed list of Jim's activities during both his 1927 and 1936 trips, but they didn't seem to know that he was smuggling money out of the country for a Jewish owner of a Frankfurt bookstore. Upon his return to the United States, Jim found that filled with memories of his acquaintances and experiences in Germany, he had, quote, an almost irrepressible desire to change any injustice he encountered, an almost impressible, irrepressible desire to set things right. For 20 years, Jim and his family lived in Chicago while he taught at the unit Medieval Lombard Theological School and the Federated Theological Faculty of the University of Chicago and lived the life of a scholar, a professor, a husband, a father, a music lover, and a social activist. And he also obtained his PhD during that period. As chairman in the field of ethics and society at the University of Chicago Divinity School, Jim found that his political experiences, which had been greatly affected 
by his earlier exposure to Nazism fed into his classes. Believing strongly that it was necessary for ministers and theologians to know the institutions of the society in which they worked, just as the Old Testament prophets had known the institutions of their society, Jim required that his doctoral students pass examinations in four social sciences. Jim worked against the rampant racism that he found in Chicago in the fields of housing and employment and in hospitals and schools. In November 1943, Jim was among those who formed the Independent Voters of Illinois, the IVI, to galvanize into action the intelligent but very unorganized liberal voters. He was co-chair of the IVI at its inception and in an effort to engender the interest of undergraduates in political activities and responsibilities, Jim co-led courses at the University of Chicago on religion and politics, power and democracies, voluntary associations, and citizen participation. After it organized precincts, the IVI was able to demonstrate its power by showing selected po politicians that it had effectively gotten out the votes on their behalf. On one of Jim's visits to Harold Ickes, Harold Ickes told Jim, I've been saving the literature of the IVI as the best damn political literature in the United States today. That was a great compliment. The IVI supported the candidacy of Paul Douglas for senator from Illinois and of Adlai Stevenson for governor. And it was the first organization to propose Adlai Stevenson as candidate for office of president of the United States. At the reception given for Jim when he left the University of Chicago faculty, Rabbi Jacob Weinstein recognized Jim's efforts in the social battlefield for better schools, better politics, civil rights, and the abolition of restrictive covenants. Now, Jim was not a supporter of utopian socialism, the movement in which groups of people volunteer to live together in socialist communities that are outside of the mainstream of society. Jim lamented their lack of participation in the larger community's political processes and felt that they weakened the democratic structure of and the possibility of justice in the larger society. He was, however, a firm believer in and supporter of voluntary associations, the non-governmental, non-profit, profit, public regarding associations, which members of a democratic nation can form and to which they can belong. About volunteerism, Jim said, 
quote, it refers to a principal way in which the individual through association with others gets a piece of the action. It is the means whereby the individual participates in the process of making social decisions. This process, particularly when it affects public policies, requires struggle, for in some fashion, it generally entails a reshaping and perhaps even a redistribution of power. End quote. And it is power with which Jim was ultimately concerned, the power of each individual, the power of each group in society. In his 1916 essay, quote, blessed are the powerful, end quote, he tells us, power must be newly defined as a creative, innovative relationship between those who have the freedom to participate in making social decisions and those who do not have that freedom. Obviously, the Christian cannot be content with philanthropy. For Philanthropy may be a means of keeping others powerless, nor can he be content with simple majority rule. Conventional philanthropy and majority rule can be a means of still further alienating the marginal person and thus increasing his self-hatred and resentment. There is a good deal of evidence to show that the deeper the sense of alienation, the greater the sense of hopelessness and the more likely the resort to violence. The truly powerful are those who serve large purposes and can accomplish them. This kind of fulfillment requires power with, not power over. It requires love and quote. And power with and love for all people is largely what I think modern day socialism is about. Reverend Kimberly Quinn Johnson is a Unitarian Universalist parish minister. Reverend Kimberly is a former organizer for UAW who is active in UU class conversations. She will talk about some of the problems that liberal congregations face in today's world. The problems of racism and classism will receive special attention. Hello, I'm the Reverend Kimberly Quinn Johnson. I serve as minister of our UU congregation of the South Fork on Long Island in Bridgehampton, New York, and I serve on the steering committee of UU Class Conversations. UU Class Conversations works to raise the conversation about class and especially about class oppression. And our congregations, our organizations, our larger association. We work to counter the stereotypes and the myths that help to justify and support hidden class inequality in our society and here at home in our congregations. Grounded in Unitarian Universalist faith in our principles and our values, we work with UUs, be it individuals or congregations or organizations, to reflect on 
how we can more fully and robustly embody and really manifest the beloved community that our faith proclaims. But our work is not only about awareness and reflection. We work with groups to build the skills needed to shift power in our institutions, to embrace real inclusion. Central to our work and our approach is an understanding of the ways that systems of oppression, exploitation, and domination are interconnected. The ways that systems of inequality work together to perpetuate each other. You probably have been hearing this these past few years as intersectionality. We bring an intersectional lens to our understanding of class oppression, uncovering the ways that class oppression is linked to and supported by racism, sexism, ableism, and other forms of oppression. Like the rest of our association, this has meant a particularly keen focus on the possibilities and really the necessities of race and class solidarity. And we think we have a lot to learn by deepening our exploration and our understanding of socialism. What role can and does socialism play in the fight for collective liberation? As people of faith, how does our theological belief and our religious practice in the world meld and mesh with socialist ideals? This is not a new exploration. We know that socialist thought and action found fertile ground among Black American intellectuals in the late 19th and early 20th century. It should not be surprising that Black activists and intellectuals would name the crux of Black liberation as freedom from economic oppression. Emerging from one race-based system of dehumanization and economic oppression, economic oppression and slavery, Blacks found themselves ensnared in evolving systems of continued economic oppression, forced labor, sharecropping, wage theft, land theft, imprisonment, lynching. These evolving systems of economic oppression tangled with racist oppression and domination because capitalism is remarkably adaptive. And here's where we can learn from our past. Because while socialist thought was clear about the workings of class exploitation and really understood that part of how class exploitation is perpetuated is by separating workers from one another. So a response to class exploitation is class solidarity, workers joining together, understanding and recognizing our common situation. White American socialists did not understand, could not face the extent to which the myth of racial difference racism and white supremacy were used as drivers and buttresses to class exploitation. W.E. Du Bois, black socialist, activist, and intellectual, described it as the psychological wage of whiteness. This stubborn persistence of racism and white supremacy which served as a real impediment to meaningful class and race solidarity. This inability to understand that not only are we linked, not only are we interdependent as laborers, as workers, as people of a common class, but that we are also interdependent and equal beyond the color line 
And so white socialists instead did not grapple with the full extent of what Du Bois calls the psychological wage of whiteness and were unable to, unwilling to, embrace a real race solidarity along with class solidarity. Unable to recognize the extent to which class exploitation was grounded in racist exploitation, not by accident or coincidence, but by design. And if you're looking for a contemporary resource to learn more about this, check out the new book by Heather McGee, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone, and how we can prosper together. But we're talking about this stubborn knot of classism and racism, class exploitation and race exploitation, and socialism and religion. And here I want to remind you that grappling with this knot is part of our Unitarian Universalist history and legacy. In 1912, Egbert Ethel Red Brown was the first black person ordained as a Unitarian minister in this country. Brown emigrated from Jamaica and settled in Harlem, where he found rich soil for his own socialist thought and action, grounded in his commitment to Unitarian ideals and principles. In his homeland of Jamaica and from his American home base in Harlem, Brown was involved in the trade union movement and in fights for economic justice and power and dignity for workers. He founded the Harlem Community Church in 1920. And throughout the decade, Brown coupled the fight for economic justice and racial justice grounded in religious belief. He was a speaker with the Socialist Party. Edward Ethel Red Brown's Harlem Community Church served as a site of political forums and impassioned discussions on politics, labor, civil rights. In response to Karl Marx's assertion that religion is the opiate of the masses, Edward Ethelred Brown preached that religion is not an opiate, but a stimulant, an incentive to noble deeds and a sustaining power in the hour of crisis. Religion, not something that dulls us or that pulls us away from the struggle, but religion as the thing that spurs us on that draws us into and sustains us in the struggle for economic and racial justice. Religion is not an opiate, but a stimulant, an incentive to noble deeds and a sustaining power in the hour of crisis. Unfortunately, Brown's radical preaching on race and socialism were not well received by Unitarian leadership of his day. Neither of the two, his stance on racial equality and justice, nor his support of socialism, endeared him to the Unitarian establishment. In 1929, Brown's fellowship was rescinded. It was eventually restored as our faith, our faith, caught up with Brown's leadership. This learning from our history is a lesson, a cautionary tale for Unitarian Universalists today. In his later years, Brown chided that the Unitarian Church were liberals, out-liberaled, out-liberaled by other more progressive denominations. That is the challenge before us today. Can we? Will we answer the call of our day as a progressive faith?
committed to collective liberation. Can we, like Egbert Ethelred Ram 100 years ago, join together the movements for economic justice and racial justice? At UU Class Conversations, this is our work, equipping our individuals and our congregations and our organizations to live into the call for race and class solidarity to embody racial justice and economic justice in our justice work and our prophetic witness in the world, and importantly, in our own institutions. As we engage in the challenge put to us by the Commission on Institutional Changes report, widening the circle of concern, as we continue to explore what it means, what it means for our faith to embrace the eighth principle, to covenant, to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness, spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. It is a lot, but not impossible and very necessary. How do we, as Unitarian Universalists, pull from our history where socialism and anti-racism and faith merged to present a path forward toward beloved community. That's our work and question. Our last speaker is Reverend Bob Murphy. Bob is a Unitarian Universalist minister in Florida. He's one of the leaders of UUJEC. He's also a democratic socialist who's, who is an advocate for disability rights and environmental justice. Bob will talk about the future of socialism in America. Hello, this is Bob Murphy in Florida, and I'm um, one of the speakers for this workshop. I'm a uh, Unitarian Universalist Minister Emeritus, and I'm also very active in the Unitarian Universalists for a Just Economic Community. I want to show you a picture of the first social, well, not the first socialist, but some of the first socialists in the United States. And we'll talk a little bit about their experience. And here they are. Take a good look at this picture. Those are Wampanoag um, Indians, Native Americans, and the year is 1636, January to be exact, middle of winter. And that man in the black hat that you can see, man in the black hat who is seated is Roger Williams. And at that point, he is an exile from Massachusetts. Uh, he's been driven into exile because he's a minister with some very controversial views. He's no longer wanted in Puritan society. He's on his own and at a critical point when he's close to freezing to death, he is saved by a group of, well, we would say socialists, Native Americans, people who practice a very good way of living and who want to be helpful to strangers who are in need. And that's really how the American story of socialism begins. And that point was recognized long ago by Friedrich Engels, the great scholar who worked with Karl Marx. He wrote a book with a long title, The Origin of the family, private property, and the state. The origin of the family, private property, and the state. It was published in 1884. And Frederick says, if you want an introduction to socialism, if you want to know what it was like uh, in the distant past, go back and look at the Native Americans. He says that in effect. He says, those were the people 
who put some of the early forms of socialism into practice, and certainly for the Americas, and not just for the Wampanoag people, he refers to tribes in New York and in other places as well. Roger Williams is a refugee, like many of us, from old forms of religion and old ways of doing things, and he's not really sure where he wants to go in 1636. But he leaves Massachusetts, eventually goes down to what becomes Rhode Island. And other refugees and radicals are also attracted to Rhode Island. Some of them are very famous, people like Anne Hutchinson and Mary Dyer. And some are not so famous, like people like Samuel Gorton and others. But all of these white people are part of something called the Radical Reformation. And if you want to understand how universalism and Unitarianism begin, you really need to go all the way back to the 1600s and study the Radical Reformation and some of the things that were happening in England and in what is now the United States. This workshop is about religion and socialism, and we've tried to discuss three things today. We've talked a bit about history, the history of religion and socialism with special emphasis on Unitarians and Universalists. We've talked about some of the experiments uh, that took place during the 1800s, and we've brought the discussion into the 20th century. With some of our humanists and some of our social gospel people and others. Much was said about James Luther Adams, who was one of my teachers, who was a socialist, a democratic socialist, and who was a great influence um, on our movement, probably our greatest theologian for the last part of the 20th century. And he taught at the Harvard Divinity School and other places, James Luther Adams. We've talked about some of the things that are happening today among the Unitarian Universalists. We've talked about racism as a problem that we're trying to overcome, other forms of oppression, including classism, economic exploitation, and these are major concerns for groups like UUs for class conversations, and certainly for uh, UUs for a just economic community. We know that the working class today is different from what it would have been 100 years ago. Workers are better educated. We talk about a great diversity of cultures, um, different races. We acknowledge the fact that women are certainly in the workforce in every occupation that you can imagine. Um, these are things that tell us a lot about what's happening in the United States today. And we realize that workers don't simply want more money, although that's important. It's always important. Workers are also concerned about issues like sexual harassment, gay rights, in some cases, religious freedom, other workplace issues that um, unions can address and particularly that they need to address when workers are oppressed and simply pushed to the margins. So we've talked about issues of race and class and what they mean in today's society. In these last minutes, I wanna talk about what socialism, democratic socialism can mean for the future for Unitarian Universalists. Pope Francis um, in the Vatican has had some wonderful statements that I encourage you to study. He talks about the throwaway society that has been created in large part by capitalism. We're talking about big money, big corporate capitalism, a society in which a lot of people are simply no longer wanted and are tossed aside just as if they were an old soda can or something else of no longer of value. We saw that happen during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, especially among people with disabilities and among senior citizens, and also certainly among racial minorities and ethnic minorities. People who are just no longer cared for by the system or who receive inadequate care and who suffer preventable deaths, who suffer a great many things that really shouldn't be allowed in an advanced society. We talk about other issues that we're concerned about we talk about labor rights and the need to bring labor laws into the 21st century. And this is a concern that Unitarian Universalists are starting to address. 
We talk about the need for a universal health plan for Americans, all Americans. Many of us support Medicare for all and Medicaid expansion. We talk about the need to bring young people and older people together. This is an age segregated society. There's a lot of ageism in America and young and old often compete with each other for resources and attention. And yet if young and old can learn how to work together, they have the opportunity to solve a lot of social and economic problems. We talk about the problems of college debt, starting a career, starting a family. Young and old people can help each other. We talk about pension issues and the difficulties of retirement. We talk about the need to protect social security. And again, there's a need for young and old people to work together to find new ways for multi-generational cooperation. We talk about environmental issues. And again, there's a need for multi-generational cooperation. And there's a need to look at the people who are the most oppressed, who suffer the most because of climate change. And I include African-Americans, Native Americans, other indigenous people, low-income people of all races and ethnic groups. These are the ones who suffer the most as each summer becomes hotter than the previous summer as the seed continues to rise, they feel the health effects and many are left behind during community disasters. And this is the kind of concern that religious socialists have begun to address because of the environmental justice movement. We talk about many areas in which progress is being made and which progress has to be made. And in some ways I bring you back to that picture of Roger Williams and the Native Americans who saved him. We're refugees from big money capitalism, a culture in which the market itself seems to become God, in which it's assumed that somehow market forces, neoliberal forces will lead us to the promised land. And yet as Pope Francis reminds us, that never seems to work. Some people grow richer and richer and they grow richer at the expense of others old people, young people, African-Americans, Hispanic people, and others. We recognize the disparities in the society and we try to leave it in search of something better, just like Roger Williams left his society in 1636. Salvation may come in many places and in many forms, but for some of us, democratic socialism is what we're beginning to explore. And there are many possibilities for this new century. I want to recommend two books to those of you who are interested in such things. First of all, for the theory, for better understanding of what's happening, I recommend Harvey Cox's book, The Market as God. The Market as God by Harvey Cox. You may want to bring this to your church reading group. Professor Cox talks about the ways in which capitalism, big money capitalism, has become very much like God in our society. Perhaps it is the God for many people. And this, of course, is an issue that Pope Francis has also addressed in some of his letters. So I recommend these writings to you if you're trying to get into the theory of what's happening and what's possible. But for you activists out there, and I have a lot of sympathy and respect for activists, this is the book I recommend. This is a good starting place. Diet for a Small Planet by a good Unitarian Universalist activist named Francis Moore LePay. And some of you have known about Francis Moore LePay for, well, 30 years or more. She's somebody very much concerned about food issues. And this is the starting place if you want to explore community organizing, mutual aid, and some related themes. I've spent part of today at a community garden in South St. Petersburg here in Florida. Different age groups, people of different races and backgrounds come together to help each other grow healthy food in the middle of a food desert. But it's more than just food. It's this ability to create a new community to help each other, to get to know each other better, to provide care where it's needed and support during a very difficult time. 
Francis Moore says we need more than a theory, we need a vision and we need the ability to put that into action. And you can learn a lot in the community garden. I encourage all of you to explore such things. You may find socialist traditions and socialist attitudes in the midst of such places. And if you do, I think you may find a new home, a new place to explore spirituality, social activism, mutual aid, and just opportunities to live a better life. This is the message I leave you with for this workshop on democratic socialism and its possibilities for a new century. Namaste. Thank you to everyone who's made today possible. Thank you to the speakers. Thank you to UU Class Conversations. Thank you to the UUA staff and volunteers for assistance. And a special thanks to the sponsor, UU's for a Just Economic Community. I'll close with these words from Desmond Tutu. This is for real. This is real. And we have committed ourselves. We've committed ourselves to the struggle until freedom is won. But we shouldn't behave like those who think this prize is a cheap little prize. The prize for which we are striving is freedom, is freedom for all of us. Even freedom for those people standing outside, the oppressors, freedom for them. Because you see, when we are free, when we are free, they will be here. They will be here joining us with celebrating that freedom and not standing outside stopping us from becoming free. Now straighten your shoulders. Come, straighten up your shoulders like people who are born for freedom. Thank you for joining us today. Go in power.